Yeah. All right, everybody. Let's finally get started. Can you all hear me? All right, because uh, I was in Detroit this morning uh, and at a conference room before that, so I'll probably I'll try to keep the mask on. Um, I did do a uh, rapid test and am asymptomatic, so uh, I'm not that worried, but just in case. Um, let's see. Oh, the other thing I was going to say is uh, if anybody's interested in, in what I was doing in Detroit, I was at a conference, but uh, we were also interviewing some people. Uh, I can show you the sizzle reel at the end if you like. Actually, there's two of them. They're pretty good. Um, the uh, video team we were working with is like amazing. Uh, so yeah, but with that, let's get started. Unless there's any questions. But yeah. Uh, probably as soon as I get my head back on straight. Uh, yeah, so we got the, the alternate exam of what happened last Friday. So hopefully by tomorrow. Can we download the alternate to test practice if we go to the original? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I could screw it, I guess. Um, yeah, it's not that different. Um, it's kind of like things are rearranged. Some of the numbers are different, but yeah, it might be good practice. Any other questions? Like normally I share everything, like left, right, and center, like all day, every day. The problem is, right, is that if I share it, then it ends up on the internet, which means then I have to like do it even, like I have to rewrite every test every time from scratch, right, which is, is quite difficult, especially with the data stuff, because I got to go through and do all the math and everything else to figure it out. Uh, so that's why I, I tend to be a little bit cautious on distribution. Um, but all right, so let's actually get started. Theory. All right. Yeah. You're muted on Zoom. Oh, am I? Oops. Uh, I shouldn't be. So I think I'll see the uh, mic in here is not working. All right. Still is. Still is. All right, so while uh, hopefully audio is getting figured out, um, let's start talking about models. And I realized I just missed it, an awesome bad joke, but I do not have anything referencing like people wearing fancy clothes and getting their picture taken, uh, which now I'm disappointed in myself. But so a model is a set of assumptions about data, okay? And in data science, uh, a model is a really important term because uh, and it gets used all the time in lots of different contexts. Uh, so it's something to really kind of understand. So in data science, many models involve assumptions about processes that involve randomness. For example, the chance models we've talked about uh, and does the model fit the data? So basically a model is kind of like what it sounds like if you think of like, uh, you know, maybe if you were a kid, if you ever put together like a car kit, right? Uh, that's, that's what we mean. Something that is representative of the actual thing, but is not the actual thing. So when we say simulation, for example, that's kind of like a subset of a model, right? Uh, where you, you're trying to say, okay, I've got this thing and it kind of models the behavior of whatever the other thing is. Uh, let me just check this down again. Uh, they're not answering me now, of course, probably because they can't hear the chat. I don't know. Uh, so with an assessment, we can simulate data according to the assumptions of the model and we can learn what the model predicts we can then compare the predictions to the data that were observed. If the data in the model predictions are not consistent. That means that there's evidence against the model. So in other words, we often want to like propose a model, right? And then we need to test it to assure that the model is doing what we think it does, that it actually models the thing in question. 
right? If you're doing a car kit and you're putting it together with glue, it's a lot easier to tell. You can just look at it and see how close it is to the real thing. And actually, it's funny, I just gave a talk with Ford uh, yesterday, and um, and they were telling me about, I don't know if you've, you've ever seen car manufacturing, right? But um, they, they used to make clay models of all the cars uh, so they could wind test them and things like that. Uh, they don't even do that anymore. Now they just do it as like a, like a souvenir um, because they do it all in a computer now. They just, it, there's no like real world testing anymore, uh, which I thought was really interesting, at least until they start manufacturing. Um, so models in the real world are often very easy to assess. Um, not always, but often. Uh, but the, when we talk about it in terms of data science, we need to be really careful that we not only have a model that is uh, kind of, uh, you know, accurate, but also provably accurate, right? So that we can be sure that we can attest to the fact that it's going to be correct. All right, so by way of an example, uh, okay, so there's sound, now I need to turn the steering on because you can't mess with the sound while you're in the screen share. All right. Hopefully the screen sharing the correct thing. Oops. All right, so this is the story about jury selection, okay? Who here knows what a jury is? All right, what's a jury? Somebody tell me, yeah. The group of your peers that are used to decide if you are guilty or not guilty of crime that they or at least that they can sign you. Okay, so in America, it's a group of your peers who uh, uh, you know is are in theory representative of people like you, right? And so a peer is a pretty broad term there. Like, you know, you can be eligible for a jury, <coughs> excuse me, at like 18, right? And be eligible, I think the stopping age is like 70, maybe something like that. Um, so that's a pretty broad range, right? For, you know, I don't know, somebody who's like 22. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is that they are not experts in law, okay? So you're basically, I think you're just banned outright from being on a jury if you're a lawyer, um, or if you're the, a different kind of lawyer. So if you're a, like a, you know, corporate lawyer or whatever, then you could be on a jury for a crime um, or like a, you know, a homicide or something. But uh, in general, like they won't select you if you're on a jury. Apparently, I just heard recently that if you're a professor, you will also not get selected, generally speaking. Um, so, uh, you know, so basically the idea is that th that they have no expertise in whatever it is that you're hearing the case about. And in that way, you bring some impartiality to making sure that the evidence that's being presented actually does kind of convict the person without it being like some, you know, tripwire in some weird language in the law that is why they're being uh, convicted rather than, you know, kind of actually having the evidence to do so. So that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, you know, most countries have juries now, but the rules are different. Uh, the rules are actually a lot different in the U.S. than most people realize. Uh, for example, different at different levels of kind of case, you'll have different numbers of people on the jury, for example. There's also things like a grand jury, you know, so there's all sorts of different stuff. But so this case, Dwayne versus Alabama, so Swain is a person in this case, Alabama is the state of Alabama. And in 1965, um, oops, sorry. Let me turn off notifications, they stop striking. Um, okay, and so in 1965 in Talladega County, Alabama, Robert Swain was convicted of a crime. Um, and so he was convicted, he went to jail, but we have in the US, we have an appeals process um, that's pretty extensive. Um, but you have to have a reason why the original uh, conviction was was bad. Okay, like like it's not that you did or didn't commit the crime. That's not what you're trying to prove when you're trying to prove an appeal. You're trying to prove that there was something wrong with the original trial. Does that make sense? Because it's kind of an important distinction here. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, and at the time, you had to be 21 or older to be part of a jury. And the population of Talladega County was 26% black, okay? Um, and Swain's jury panel consisted of 100 men. Oh, did I mention? Yeah, at the time, men were the only people on juries as well. Um, and eight men on the panel were black, okay? So uh, so there's two pieces here you have to know a little bit about, which, yeah. Um, 
So <laughs> what they do is they would call impanel a hundred people, and then they select some set of that hundred to be on the actual jury. Okay. Normally, especially if you read any, you know, books that mention juries, it's often 12. Okay. Is the typical number for the size of the jury. So, but they get a hundred people first and then they whittle it down to 12. Okay. Because they found out the first person they selected was actually a lawyer, for example. Right. So now that person's ineligible. You move on to the next one. So hopefully you get 12 out of 100. That's the idea. Um, but on this panel, only eight of the men were black. So does anybody see a problem with this? Any ideas? Right. Right. So, so it's supposed to be there's basically what uh, Robert Swain was arguing is that it's it's not an equal distribution compared to the population. Okay, and it's supposed to be. So, uh, so he he went to court with this, and it made it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said in what did I say 1965? Yeah, 1965. That the overall percentage disparity had, has been small and reflects no studied attempt to include or exclude a specified number of, we're not going to say that word, um, but what do you think? Do you, do you agree with the Supreme Court or disagree with the Supreme Court? Right and left hands, what do you think? Uh, right hand is you agree, left hand is you disagree. Okay, so basically the right hand is saying that 8% and 26% are close enough. Okay, does that make sense? Everybody get it? All right, so now what we're gonna do is explain the thing I just said, um, which is, uh, you know, he added the model, okay? So is eight out of 100, right, a realistic outcome if the jury panel selection process were truly unbiased, okay? So we're kind of adding a little bit here. So we're not really saying, eight versus 26 per se, what we're saying is, is it unbiased? So can you so can you end up with eight um, who are, uh, you know, because, oh, sorry, I should have backed this up a little bit. The hundred is selected from the general county at random, okay? And then they do the whittling down process, I forgot to mention that part. But so that hundred, right? So you, you would expect it to be 26%, right? To be black and the other part to be whatever other demographic it is, right? So if it's truly unbiased, then is eight a reasonable outcome? So some of you said, yes, you think it is possible. Um, and what we're gonna try to show is like, how often is it possible? So what we do is we call the sampling from a distribution. So we're gonna sample at random from a categorical distribution using a new function called sample proportions. Uh, which samples at random from the population, and it returns an array containing the distribution of the categories in the sample. Okay, and so we'll explain that more by showing it to you because I think it'll make more sense. Eventually. All right, let's see. Did it work for me today? That'd be cool. Yes. All right. So when we use sample proportions, basically what we do is we pass in the proportions we want. So imagine, you know, we have a, you know, big bucket, okay? And we have a set of, you know, black ping pong balls and white ping pong balls. And we want to say, okay, I want a new bucket with the correct ratio in the bucket of, of color ping pong balls, right? So what you do is you pass those two numbers in for the percentages you want of those two uh, of the population, basically. So any idea is what I should pass in for those two numbers? Based on the, the Swain, Alabama story? What do you think? Uh, so remember, what we're trying to do is actually get the panel size, okay? So what's the distribution across that panel that we expect, okay? Because we know the Alabama County uh, panel distribution. Uh, how about you way in the back? 
So that's a kind of similar answer to his. Oh, like you're going to take ballpark, but not quite. Right. So what we want to say is we want to model Alabama, the county at least, right? So we want to say 26% is going to be the black population and 74% is going to be the whatever other population. Okay. Probably white, given it's Alabama and then six. Um, so, but to do that, we just use decimals and we say 0.26. 0.74, right? Yeah. Um, and so now we have a population proportion. Oh, sorry. Um, so we're actually in an array that has those two proportions. And so then we can pass the array. I was I got ahead of myself. Along with the size of the population we want to measure. So this is where your 800 come in. Okay. So what we do is we say 100. And then we pass it the population distribution, basically. Um, that would actually probably be a better word here because it'd be more consistent. There we go. All right. And what we get back is a random sampling. So in other words, they pulled 100 out of this infinite bucket Okay, because they want to make a new bucket, they pulled 100 out with the expectation that the po population of the infinite bucket is 26% to 74%. Okay, and we pulled it one time, well, we pulled 100 of them, okay, and we ended up with a distribution of 0.25 and 0.75, but if we run it again, this time it was 0.2 and 0.8, okay, or 20 and 80, okay. So this is where the randomness comes in, right? So what this does, it lets us try that jitter, okay? It's called jitter when things are a little wobbly like that. Um, and so what we're doing is this is how we can get down the road of, can we show how often eight people out of the hundred would be selected or 0 0.08, right? Right, yeah. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's kind of the tool we use. And so it'll come in really handy. All right, so now we're gonna make a function out of it because what do we wanna do? Why do we wanna make a function here? <laughs> Did you wanna pass in different inputs? Simulate it. But, well, okay, yeah, keep going. Like, what do you mean by different inputs? Oh, oh yeah, we're up up there. Wanna pass in multiple times. Right, so you wanna do it a whole mess of times, right? And kind of see what we end up with for the distribution after running it a bunch of times, because then we can see if eight out of a hundred is plausible. Does that make sense? Okay, so to do that, we're just gonna do sample. Nope. It's had completion, never work when I'm on stage. Uh, sample proportions. And we're just going to do the 100 like we were doing before with the same population proportion. And then now this, I, I can cheat a little bit because I know what I'm looking for, right, is I'm looking for this number, right? I don't actually really care what that number is. First of all, I can calculate it. But second of all, that's not what I'm going for, right? What I want to know is how often is this 0 0.08, right? That's my goal. You follow me? Yes, dots. Yeah. All right. Is it three thirty in the afternoon? Um, all right. So let me see. Did I forget? Any? All right. So then I declare my function, and then I'm just going to run it one time. I knew I had a bug. Oh, sample proportions. All right, so this time I ran it to 0.29. So it's just like I was doing up here, except I'm just pulling out the one part, okay? So now I wanna do it a whole mess of times, right? So what I'm gonna do is create something to collect it in, right? These panels, okay? So these are the impaneled duries, right? Um, so we're gonna run a thousand panels, okay? So a thousand times, we're gonna go and get a hundred out of our infinite bucket and see how many of those have 
black ping pong balls versus white ping pong balls. So let's see. Uh, to do that, it's pretty straightforward. We just call our new little function again. Portion. And then to make it a little easier to work with, we're going to actually multiply it by 100. Okay, because it doesn't really matter, right? We, we don't we don't care per se, um, like kind of where in the range it is. We're just, it's a lot easier if we think about it in terms of the eight, right? Versus 0 0.08. So we're gonna multiply by an eight by a hundred just to kind of make it a little easier to read. All right, and so now we have to append that onto our uh, collector. And it's already done. And so now I can look at a histogram. Okay. So what is this telling us? Thirties, yeah, six, seven, something. Yeah, so basically, most of the time, right, our kind of first number there, right, so the number of Black people on the panel should be between 15 and, I don't know, 37, 38, something like that. All right, what, what do we notice that is not in that? Right. Right. So it might be over here, remember, because we've seen other ones where the distribution, the, the number over here is so small that you don't even see it. So that it's possible, okay? It is possible with random chance, right? That we pull that out, we could get an eight, right? However, it's pretty unlikely, okay? So what we could be doing here, right? Is that what's interesting, has anyone ever heard of expert testimony? All right, what's expert testimony? Ideas, anyone wanna explain it? Like you're giving an expert testimony. All right, so expert testimony. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Right. So that's exactly it, right? And and you put in the keyword that I wanted to make sure it was there, which is certified. Okay. So so there is. Um, an expert always has to have some, you know, some kind of paper, right? Whether it's like a PhD or an MD or a, you know, or a license or a whatever to say they are officially an expert. Um, and then usually they're also reasonably well known in their field. Um, and what they do is they give testimony about various things, um, at, especially at the Supreme Court level, they'll bring in expert testimony to kind of talk about like the subject area um, because you know, obviously, if you're a judge, you don't necessarily know everything there is to know about stuff that isn't law, right? So that's what often happens. Um, there's all kinds of uh, interesting things there. Uh, Red Hat, my former company, used to do it a lot with Supreme Court cases because there's so many cases that are about software and copyright law. Uh, so they're always really interesting. So if we were providing expert testimony at that Supreme Court hearing, what would we recommend when we heard their their conclusion before they maybe wrote it? And I think the answer is probably pretty obvious for them. Yeah. Put like a statistician or somebody who could talk about the demographics and the likelihood that happens. Right. And so, so what would the answer be? That it's wrong. Yeah, that they're wrong, right? Um, so let's see. And I think, yeah, I think we're going to move back to the slides from here. But as you can see, we can actually figure out the answer to their the Supreme Court's question, right? Is that is this within the range of you know plausibility? You know, yes, of course it's possible, but that's not really what they said. What they said was basically what they were kind of almost saying is that if it had been a twenty three, right? That's that's a reasonably good chance, right? It could even really be a 20, and it might be still a pretty good argument for it's close enough, right? But what they were saying is that an eight was over here. Yeah, that makes sense? All right. 
So, um, so basically, what we did was we created, or the Supreme Court really, right, created a model, okay, and then we disproved that model. Going back to this, no, not this, this. So here is our model, and what we essentially did was said this model is is not correct, okay. All right, so here's another one. This is a genetic model. All right, has anybody ever heard of Gregor Mendel? Yeah, and I think I mentioned the class already uh, about pea plants and they have actually really pretty flowers. Um, but uh, he, let's see, uh, uh, some of the experiments. So, you know, very early geneticist, okay? Um, and did a lot of ex his experimentation really through what I think is always kind of funny if you think about it, right, is that essentially he's doing, you know, uh, GMO right here, right? Because like we associate GMO with like being really weird and stuff. But in fact, we've been doing it with vegetables, uh, you know, since we've started farming, right? Because you're just crossbreeding things in a way to get a certain outcome. So it's kind of interesting that now all, all bad things are now just called GMO when in fact, all farming is GMO, but then there's some parts of it that maybe are more questionable than others. Uh, so, I don't know, it's like you, you shouldn't throw the baby out with bathwater, when we know that term. Um, all right, so pea plants of a particular kind, each one either has purple flowers or white flowers, and Mendel's model is that each plant is purple flowering with a chance of 75%, regardless of the colors of the other plants. So essentially, you find a, a patch of pea plants or pea flowers, um, and 75% of them will be purple and 25% will be white, okay? And so what we want to know is, is this model good or not, right? So the way we would do that is we take a sample and see what percent of purple flowering. If that percent is much larger or much smaller than 75, that's evidence against the model and the distance from the 75 is the key. So we've talked about this before, <laughs> absolute value, right? Absolute value shows us distance and not direction, okay? And so in this case, all we care about is the distance. So we're just going to drop the direction, uh, which makes other math later simpler. And so what we do is just indicate it with the bars, but this is now our statistic, right? So we talked about statistics are things that you have to calculate, right? Um, and if the statistic is large, that is evidence against the model, as you can imagine. Okay. So now we go back to the demo. <coughs> Scroll. All right, so what we're going to do is this, this was his real experiment, okay? So he had 929 plants and 709 of them had purple flowers, okay? So what we want to know is, first up is what is the observed purple flowers, okay? So what we do to do that is we just take the 709 and divide it by 929 or 922, okay? And so we get about 0.76, um, but then now what we can do is, now we know what that population is supposed to look like because off the original real data. So it's not quite the 75 that I mentioned on the slide, it's actually a little bit north of 76%, okay? So what we do next is we're going to make an array here. All right, anybody tell me what I should put in here? All right, so this is the distribution population. How about you right there? Uh, 0.25 and 0.75. Correct, but let's do it in reverse because this in this one we care. Like it's easier we kind of always want to work with the first number, um, even though I would have done exactly the same thing because I always want to put the bigger numbers on the right. Um, but just for the sake of my demo, I'm going to do this one first. Okay. All right. And then we need the total population size, which as we established earlier is 929. And now we can pull a sample of purple flowers versus white flowers. And in this case, we got 73% and 27%. Okay. So now we do basically exactly the same thing. And we just write an array so that, sorry, an array, a function so that we can do the prediction over and over again. 
rather than have to retype it each time or something weird like that. And then we just pull off um, item zero, and we're going to multiply it by 100 for ease of reading. Nope, if I can find the right key. All right, and so now we have a little function that will do our sampling for us. Uh, and now if we call this a whole bunch of times, right, it should be a different value each time, and it's only going to give us the number of purple flowers, okay? All right. So then we just do kind of the same thing again, except this time we're going to do it for our thousand uh, flowers, or sorry, thousand <laughs> samples. Um, so, wait, let me just say, oh no, I'm um, able. So we take, you know, 929 flowers with the distribution we were talking about. We pull, we pull that randomly, right, from an infinite set of flowers that have the correct proportions. And we do each one, each set of 929, we do it a thousand times, and we end up with 76% in this particular sample were purple, and in that one were 72% or 73%, et cetera. You get the idea. All right. So then we can take that and make a nice histogram out of it. And so we can see our range here. And let's see what I was showing here. And then we can do our final test to find out what our distance is. Okay. So if we do circles minus 75. So now we've kind of restructured our graph a little bit, right? So in this one, we kind of see, you know, it falls between like 72 and 78, give or take. Um, and that's how many purple flowers we were getting. That's not actually what we're going after, right? What we're actually going after is he had a theory that it was 75%. So we want to know how does the histogram look versus 75%? Does that make sense? Okay, so... This is 75%. That's pretty good, right? So more than 50% of the time, um, he got 75 purple flowers on out of our thousand sample sets. Okay. And then, you know, a little bit less often he was within one, but we don't know the direction. So it could be either way. So it could be 74 or 76. Make sense? All right. So we kind of start to extrapolate away from it. And that's why we look at this as a, a statistic, right? Because it's not the actual observation. It's a calculation based off of it. And then I think we go back to the slides. And then I had another line of code, but I don't know what it's for, so I'm not gonna do it. All right. All right. So now we start this is kind of getting back into the formal language of it. So we have the model and the alternative. Okay. And so the model was in the case of the jury selection, the number of people on or the people on the jury panels were selected at random from the eligible population. And the alternative viewpoint is it's basically whatever the negative is, right? Whatever the reverse is. And that's no, they were. And then 75% were purple flowers or they weren't. Okay. That makes sense. So this is just kind of how we formally write it so that it's clear what we want to say. All right. So then to kind of, this is the flow that we actually just did. Okay. So what we want to do is figure out in advance, we figure out the statistic we're going to use to measure the discrepancy between the model and the data. Then we're going to simulate the statistic by basically that's the thousand sample pollings, right? And then we're going to compare that data to the model's prediction. And then we're going to draw a histogram of the simulated values of the stat and compute the observed statistic from the real the sample. Uh, and then, oh, that's the last bit was. <laughs> um, and if the observed statistic is far from the histogram, that's evidence against the model. Okay. All right. So basically, this is a theory of the theft to prove or disprove the model or the alternative. Okay. And just to be clear, you're always trying to prove the model, okay? If 
remember we were talking about complements the other day. Um, you know, sometimes it's actually easier to prove the alternative. So you just reverse it, right? You make you make whatever it was easier to prove or disprove the model, and then the other one is the alternative. Okay, but you're always trying to prove the model. <coughs> All right. So has anybody ever heard of A B testing? All right, anybody want to tell me what it is? All right. So that's when we compare values of sampled individuals in group A with values of sampled in individuals in group B. Um, so that's why it's called A and B. Okay, so A and B. Um, it's also heavily used in software development um, in a very similar context. So do the two sets of values come from the same underlying distribution? And answering this question by performing a statistical test is called A-B test. So now we'll do a demo, which hopefully will make it make more sense. And so we have a table of birth weights, okay? And so we're just gonna read it in and then print it out. I don't know why half the time I make these two lines, um, but as you can see, okay, so this is the baby's birth weight in probably not pounds, because that would be really bad. Um, I think it is in uh, in ounces, actually. Um, and then gestational days. So how long was the mother pregnant? Uh, how old was the mother? How tall was the mother? And uh, how much did the mother weigh when she was pregnant? And then was she a smoker or not? Because this study is about, does smoking affect the birth weight of babies? They may know the answer to this. All right. Everybody should know the answer. What's the answer? It does, right? It, it definitely lowers the birth rate of babies. Uh, this is from, this was a real study that they did. Um, and so one of the many reasons that smoking is not very good. All right. So we're just going to pull out the two columns we care about, which is that they were a maternal smoker and the baby's birth weight. And then we can group it by whether they're a smoker and then the count of the babies, okay? So, um, wait. Yeah, so so we have 715 babies that uh, were the children of non-smoking mothers, and we have 450 that or 459 that are children of smoking mothers. So that seems like pretty good data, all right? And so we can kind of put it on a graph so that we can see it a little bit better. Um, but as you can see from this picture, right, we look, it, you know, it's pretty clear that being a smoker, uh, you know, as a mother, it makes the child's weight smaller, okay? However, why is this not conclusive? Yeah. Because there's so much overlap. So that's, that's part of it, but I was looking for something else that we also used as a buzzword in a previous lecture. Uh, how about you? Right, so there could be different factors, right? There could be other stuff going on or confounding factors, which is the buzzword I was looking for. Um, and uh, so I think, I feel like this is a lie that we go back to the slide, but let's see. Yeah, no, it's okay. All right, so could the difference be due to chance alone, right? So the birth weights of babies and mothers who are smoked during pregnancy and the babies of mothers who didn't smoke so here are our two groups, okay? So we're gonna do A-B testing to try to show that we can say for sure that the birth weight is affected directly by maternal smoke, okay? And so we put them in two categories. And then we come up with what we call the null and alternative hypotheses, okay? Which you probably or may have you know, learned about in other classes. So in the population and distributions, the birth weights of babies in the two groups are the same. They are different in the sample just due to chance. So what I always find personally particularly confusing is that the null hypothesis is kind of what we're trying to prove, yet the gut instinct is usually the alternative. Okay, so just kind of remember that it's kind of the same idea as we've been talking about before. It's like we're trying to prove the negative, okay? Or we're trying to prove the the basically the smaller sample space. And so what we're going to say is that they are the same. And that's going to be our null hypothesis. We believe the alternative to be true. Does that make sense? Okay, so 
that's that's kind of how we term you know the terminology for it is the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. And then I'll write this slide here. Um and so basically what that does is a dope thing. No. Okay, so what that does is it makes it so that we can kind of limit where we have to look in our histogram to find out the answer. Okay. So if it's down here, right, in this small space, then we know uh, like it's it's zero, right? Whereas if we were trying to prove something in this space, it's harder because the range is so wide. So what we want to do is we want to look in what's called the long tail, okay? And um, I don't know, yeah, does anybody here know what the long tail on the internet means? Does it ring any bells? So that's all those like retailers and shops or whatever that uh, you don't find casually. You get to by being an expert or whatever. It's called the long tail of the internet. So, um, so what we refer to it as is in the tail. And uh, so, and then what we call, and then kind of this is again, formal terminology. So we call it inconsistent with the null or consistent with the null. And the test statistic is in the tail of the empirical distribution under the null hypotheses. I probably should reverse those slides. That would make more sense. So. Basically, and this is where you start to see, this might be when you've seen statistics about say COVID, for example, where you start to see in the tail, but really what you'll see is like statistically significant, right? That term ring a bell. So to be clear, these are not formal, okay? They're just common practice, okay? So you could have something that is highly statistically significant and it's 10%, okay? It's just that, by rule of thumb or by convention or whatever, most people will, or you know, most scientists will say it's statistically significant if it's with in that five percent of the tail. Okay, so down there in that little spot there, or one percent. Okay, so if your distribution is like you're only got one percent in that whole block, then it's highly statistically significant. Does that make sense? Okay. Because what you're trying to find is as little as possible in there, and that's going to prove your point. Okay, so then we talk about what's called the p-value and the empirical distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis. And the red dot is the actual observed statistic. Um, so this is where we get into how do we how do we talk about it, right? So that p-value is over here, okay? And then this just happens to be you know like our um, the actual sample of plants, right? So it's going to be somewhere in this histogram, you imagine, right? Um, but that just happens to be where it is in this particular spot. Uh, it may or may not be in that kind of end tail, right? But it typically is more, I would say, more in the center. Um, and we'll come back to this more too. But so the definition of the p value, p value is the chance if the null hypothesis is true that the test statistic is equal to the value that was observed in the data or is even further in the direction of the alternative. Okay, so what does that mean is like, if you look at this and we say, we wanna know how likely this is to be kind of in the null hypothesis or in the alternative hypothesis. And that's what the p-value tells you is like, we can actually estimate where an, the actual an actual observation will be along this line. Does that make sense? And and why is that useful? Because that that way we can say that um, we can kind of say like we know that we're within this percent of where an observed value would be. Okay, so that tells us how good a guess we're making. All right, so, and the real name of a p-value is the observed significance level, okay? But it's referred to as p-value. Um, yeah, and often written that way. All right, so our test statistics, so now I'll kind of show it to you, but hopefully it'll help solidify it a bit. But so if we have two groups, we have group A are non-smokers, right? And then group B are smokers. Um, in this particular case, we could have reversed them. Doesn't really make any difference. Um, and then the difference between the average rates is going to be the group B average, right, minus the group A average, and negative values of this statistic favor the alternative. 
Now, if you recall, the alternative is that a smoking mother will have a lower birth weight baby, and the null hypothesis is that the two will be equal. Okay. So, going back here. So, we want to look at this statistic and we want to say, okay, we're going to group the, the maternal smokers together um, and, oops. oh boy, that was way off. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to group the type of, uh, you know, birth parent or birth mothers uh, together, and then we're going to take the average of their baby's weights. And now we know, okay, so, you know, 123 uh, ounces and 113, um, and then we can do, yeah, as you, I think several people have asked me the difference between mean and average. Uh, as you can tell, I use them pretty interchangeably. Um, and so, let's see. So we stuck that in this thing called means table here. And then we looked at column one, right? Which is just going to be our two uh, weight averages. And then we just said, okay, our observed difference based on the data we actually had. So not simulated data. What is our actual observed difference? And so it's going to be minus 9.3, okay? So that means, right? So that we're we're about, you know, nine point three ounces heavier in the non-smoking, uh, you know, women's children. <laughs> All right. So now we got to take the next step, which is we're going to start to do some samples. But before we do that, we want to take a table. All right, we're going to make a function that is going to do the work for us. And, but we're going to make it a little bit more generic. And then we're going to say, produce, without the question mark, average, it's a lot of typing. Okay, so, oops. So all we did was the exact same thing we did above, except we made it more generic in a function, okay? So we're actually gonna pass in the table, then we're gonna pass in um, the label or the column name, right, of the thing we want to measure, which in this case is the birth weights, okay? And we're going to pass in the label of the column we want to group by. Okay. So, as I said, it's exactly the same as this. It's just we're using it generically so we can pass in any table and any column. All right. So, theoretically, I don't have any typos. That function will work. And so, to get exactly what I did up here, I can just call that function with the correct parameters and not have bugs. Oh, wait, let's call it. Oh, I missed the line of code. That's all. Thank you. Yeah. No, I missed the return. That's what it is. Oh, no, actually. Yeah, I think when I uh, hit enter and I screwed it up. Uh, so this should be here, and this should be means, it's probably make more sense now.
All right, so theoretically that'll work now. Yeah, okay, much better. Okay, so first thing we do is we take the two columns, right? Just like we did in the first example. Then we take that new table, okay, and then we're gonna group by whatever one we wanna group by is passed in by the method. And we're gonna take the average of the other column, right? That's how group by works. We're gonna put that in something called means table. Then we're gonna take the means table and just get the rightmost column, right? Which is column one in this case. We're gonna put it in an array called means. And then we're gonna take, um, basically, there's only two items, right? Just like up here, right? There's just the, you know, one, two, because we did a group and now we only have two groups. So then we're just gonna return that subtraction of the averages. And then we get the exact same value we did before. Does that make sense? All right. So this, this is kind of handy because you can now use it for any groups. And that's why, and that's what we're going to get to in a minute. All right. So I looked long and hard to find a, a buggy for putting on this graphics. I, I hope you all appreciate it. Um, but so, you know, as we discussed, right, we have a bunch of babies. And they have all different weights. And if you notice, we have, you know, also on this fancy, fancy picture, we have whether the parent was a smoker or non-smoker. And so what we can do is if we take a random permutation, so a table of n rows picked randomly with replacement. So we haven't really talked about this yet before, but it's kind of alluded to, it's alluded to in the midterm, which is basically like, imagine the candy bowl, okay? Um, you know, most candy bowl, you take the candy and you walk away. Okay. So that would be without replacement. All right. But if every time a kid takes a piece of candy, the, you know, the person who owns the, the candy bowl replaces the missing candy item, that would be with replacement. Does that make sense? All right. And these are two kind of formal terms. Um, and they'll, and you'll see them actually introduced uh, here, right? where now we can use our sample function and we can actually do with replacement false, with replacement true. Um, and yeah, you can read the rest. Um, any questions? Good so far? All right. All right, so back to our fancy picture with, with babies and the smokers or non-smokers. Now, this is what we can do to try to figure out if the data in question that we're measuring, is that the only factor, okay? So what we can do is what we can do is, or sorry, I'm saying the same thing. We can shuffle our labels, okay? So what if we randomly reassigned whether the parent was a smoker or non-smoker, right? So what do you think that would do? Any ideas? Distribution even. Right, so, so if we kind of just flip them around at random, right? Now, if we can, we can start to figure out, let's see what I have on my next slide. Um, yeah, so if we uh, switch them around at random, then we can say, hey, if they come out to be now even, where all the birth weights of the two groups are on average the same, that means that we've gotten rid of whatever the factor was that was changing the birth weights. Does that make sense? So, but we have to be careful to do it randomly, right? Because otherwise we might introduce some accidental bias or something like that. Um, but we can then figure out that, oh, in fact, the smoking mother is the reason why the birth weight is lower because when we shuffle the labels, they have the same birth weights. So it's kind of like working at it in reverse. All right, so to do it, if the null is true, all rearrangements of labels are equally likely, okay? In the way we structured our null and our alternative. And so we shuffle all the group labels, assign each shuffled label to a birth weight, and then find the difference between the averages. Now here's the key, right? Is that we repeat it. And why do we repeat it? Is it to sell more shampoo? Right, so if we repeat it a whole mess of times, right, we can control for like what we might get an accidental random sample that doesn't come out right, right? So we need to do it a whole mess of times to reduce the impact of randomness, okay? And then we can demo it. 
can find the right window. All right, and so, oops. Let's, yeah, so here's a, hopefully a pretty quick example. Wait, where it goes. So this is where we kind of are gonna use sample to do our shuffling, okay? And so if we make it all right, so with replacement false. That's not the right word. Okay, so we have this little table that has some letters in it, and then we are going to sample from it. But if we did with replacement equals true, right, we could get all A's, right? We need to make sure that we only get each one once. Okay, why do you think that is? I mean, other than it like feels logical. Any ideas? Because we have to keep the distribution of the smoking and non smoking mothers. Okay, so we can't all of a sudden change how many times we have an A, okay? So otherwise it's gonna throw off our result. All right, and so to get it pretty, it like kind of in one line, right? We can just do our sample here and do with placement. Um, Right. And so now we've just shuffled it by just essentially using the sample method to get a bunch of, uh, you know, get them out, but we do it with replacement, uh, sorry, without replacement so that um, we don't get the same letter again, or in the real case, we don't get the smoking or non smoking again. Okay. So we go back to our original table, which is got a bunch of babies. Um, and then we can do that sample right and then we just get a set of shuffled labels okay and uh you know so this will literally just be the smoking versus non-smoking being true and false and then we can add it to our table and there it is okay and so now right we know because we use with replacement or we use without replacement um we know that there's exactly the same number of trues here as there are here they're just not in the same order okay so then if we do that, we can say, okay, so if we actually use our original difference of means, okay, except we're going to use the shuffled label, then we get a 0. 0.5 here. And then we can do this one and we get our negative nine. Okay, so remember, this is the distance away from equal the averages were, okay? So as you can tell, when we shuffle the labels on the smoking or non-smoking, they're very close to the same, right? It's only 0.5 away from them being equal. So, you know, whereas this is basically nine ounces less on the weight of the children. Okay, and if we do it again, we should get a slightly different answer, but in the same ballpark, okay? Because we're randomly sampling. Actually, we're not, it's not gonna change. Um, if we had put this method kind of in there. So, so we were talking about, we can do a function now. And basically we're gonna do the exact same thing we did above, <laughs> except we're gonna say table dot sample with placement. And then we're going to, Wait, let me see. No, no. Okay, and then we can go. Let's see. I'll talk, actually, maybe I should have just left this typed in here because I'll explain it when I'm done with these here. Select. And then. Then that might be right, hopefully. 
Okay, so what I do is the first thing I do is I go and get all the labels, right? And then I just shuffle them, okay, into an array. Then I, I add a new column to the table, just like I did above, and I uh, and have a, that new column just called shuffled label. And then I return the difference for the shuffled table with the original label, um, you know, or the birth weights in the case we've been looking at. And then the but using the shuffled maternal smoker versus non-smoker. And so now we have a simulated difference. This one's actually pretty far apart compared to the other times we tried it, right? This is, um, you know, nearly one ounce weight difference, okay? But that's exactly the, the problem we're trying to fix. So what we're gonna do is for 2,500 times this time, we're gonna run each of those samplings again. We're gonna shuffle all the labels again, calculate that difference in means, and then uh, basically keep adding it to a new, uh, new array of just those differences. So now we can look at a histogram about the difference in the weights versus shuffled labels. Sometime soon, hopefully. This does not seem like it should take as long. It's not actually that hard. Apparently, the uh, SEC gets tired around, you know, 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. I really have no idea what's taking All right, but long story short, we'll, you know, we'll see in a minute, hopefully. Um, but the idea is basically that we're just going to keep shuffling those labels over and over and over again until we get a whole set of, of comparisons between the original, um, the original data and the shuffle data so that we can then have a histogram and see how far apart they are. And that would be really cool if we could print it, but it doesn't want to do it. Uh, all right. Oh, wait, actually, maybe. Oh, yeah. So this is in my uh, cheat sheet, but at least it still has the actual stuff. All right. So this is what we're waiting to run, right? But then we can actually um, uh, make, you know, we make that histogram and then the observed difference was, was negative nine ounces, right? Um, and here we see that we have a pretty strong histogram right here in the center, which says that most of the time when you shuffle the labels, the weights are the same between the groups. So therefore we can make pretty good confidence. We can say that, um, the, the smoking is what is changing about the data. And so therefore smoking causes low birth weight. Make sense? All right, any questions? Any other slides? Nope. Any questions? All right, cool. Well then I will see you on Tuesday. Oh, and like I said, if anyone wants to see the simple reel, I'll, I'll throw it up. Thanks. Uh, I think, uh,